Greetings from the PAN Foundation. We thank you so much for joining today's webinar, Health Equity in Action, Mitigating Barriers to Mental Health Services. We know everyone is incredibly busy and appreciate your spending your time for the next hour with us. Once again, we're confident it's gonna be time well spent and we hope by the end you'll agree. My name is Kim Bach and my pronouns are she, her. I am the Chief Diversity and Health Equity Officer at the PAN Foundation. And on behalf of PAN and CVS Specialty, I am pleased to present this second health equity webinar today. Before we begin, let's go over a few housekeeping items. First, for your convenience and reference later, this webinar will be recorded and it'll be available on our website. Next, throughout the, this webinar, if you have any questions, please submit them in the QA section in your Zoom chat box. And last, all contact information for our speakers will be provided at the end of the presentation. Today, you're gonna to hear from three speakers. Dr. Dare Richardson Heron, who is our moderator and subject matter expert in her own right, strives to maintain excellence in all that she does. Dr. Richardson Heron is a physician Fortune 100 leader, board director, patient advocate, and transformative change agent who has worked for more than 30 plus years to advance diversity and innovation in research and clinical trials, remove access barriers, and eliminate health disparities across every sector. Next is Dr. Dustin Nawaski. He is founder. They are founder and president of OutCare Health. And finally, Vic Armstrong is Director of Soul Shop for Black Churches. You'll hear much more from and about these esteemed panelists later during the webinar. But first, let me share a bit of information about PAN. In essence, the Patient Access Network Foundation, more commonly known as PAN, is a nonprofit safety net organization aimed at assisting the underinsured with chronic, life-threatening and rare diseases, mainly in two ways. First, by helping to cover out-of-pocket expenses for medications, treatments, and transportation. And secondly, by advocating for improved healthcare access and affordability for all people, particularly those suffering from chronic illness. Since 2004, PAN has helped more than 1 million people receive more than $4 billion in financial assistance across more than 70 disease funds. During the webinar series, we will engage panelists in meaningful yet practical discussions. Our goal is to aim healthcare professionals with the knowledge and the tools needed to build the case for establishing and expanding their organizations, healthcare programs and practices, and build solid and equitable healthcare ecosystem for all people. As you can see, the agenda is quite full today. We're gonna to share a few findings from our national poll to case studies and engage in a panel discussion. We also have time at the end for audience questions. So let's get started. Now the video that you are about to see is an illustration of the anxiety and angst that we believe is a current sentiment throughout the country and one that is impacting the mental health of all of us. The video contains sensitive material and may be considered overwhelming and or triggering for some, but this is important to set the context for today's discussion.
Dara, we believe you're muted. Give me just one second, okay? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So sorry, just give me one second with apologies. Stop, stop, stop. Stop it, Dara. Go to the panel silence. All right, we're back. Can you hear me now? We yes. can. Okay, and my deepest apologies. My computer decided to just lose its mind uh, right as I was beginning to speak. So let me start at the top. Uh, thank you again, Kim, for sharing this video. As I mentioned, it, it's it's both powerful and really um, discomforting in so many ways. Um, clearly, we are in the midst of a national mental health crisis. Uh, each one of us really is inundated by all of the negativity that we, our families and close friends experience both personally and, and we're also bombarded, uh, as the video mentioned, by a barrage of, of disturbing information that's in our traditional news outlets, on social media, um, and all the time. And all of this has the potential to negatively impact our mental health. Um, you know, there was a time when we might have said mental health issues touch only some of us. But given the sheer magnitude of, of everything that's happening in today's world, not one of us really is immune to, to mental health challenges. And you know, I just wanna say that while mental health can mean different things to different people, I wanna ground us in the definition of mental health as a continuum or a spectrum really that, that stretches from places where we feel great and we are thriving in our daily lives to the other end of the spectrum or continuing where we're actually struggling because of a challenge or condition like depression or anxiety that may require professional support, counseling, and even medication. But you know what the really good news um, here and, and the news to remember is that mental health conditions are treatable and, and manageable and, and with the right knowledge, access, professional support, financial resources, support networks, and treatment, we can all uh, do our best to make sure that our mental health continuum stays in the place where we are thriving, even despite all the challenging issues in our own lives and the troubling issues facing our nation and our world today. That's why I'm deeply honored to have the opportunity to partner with PAN, with CBS Specialty, and our esteemed panelists, Dr. Dustin Nawaski and Mr. Vic Armstrong, to start the dialogue and, uh, for this very important conversation today about mitigating barriers to mental health services. Now, let me also express my thanks and appreciation to each of you in our audience for taking time out of your schedules to, to join us today and to contribute to this very important discussion with your insights and questions. Now, although we won't be able to take questions during the presentation, we definitely wanna hear from, from our audience. So please um, uh, uh, you know, make sure to put your comments, your questions in the chat box as they come to you. And, and we will do our very best um, to respond to as many as we possibly can within the time allotted. Next slide, please. So let's get started. To, to help us better understand some of the barriers faced by individuals and communities when seeking mental health services, over the past two months, PAN and CVS Specialty partnered with a group called Morning Consult to conduct a survey of seven distinct populations as indicated on the left of this slide. Um, the group you'll see as noted um, a general population in item number one, it was designed to reflect the diversity of the US population as outlined by the Census Bureau. Um, so this group includes adults from all racial and ethnic categories polled, as well as LGBTQ plus identifying adults. And as a, a really special thank you um, to each of you for joining our webinar today, as, as Kim mentioned, we're going to give you a sneak preview of select findings uh, from the national poll. 
Uh, and I just also want to note that while many of the slides uh, will present the data um, from the seven uh, distinct populations surveyed, given time constraints, we won't be able to specifically address findings from all of the populations surveyed, but um, we're going to focus much of our discussion today on the general population group, as well as the populations currently being served by our panelists, namely the LGBTQ plus and the Black populations. But I just want to um, reiterate that we recognize fully that the mental health findings from every population and community surveyed are all vitally important. And that's why we're committed to publishing the full results um, on PAN's website uh, in the next month. Uh, and it's our hope that you will review the information in its entirety and, and leverage the findings to enhance your work within the respective communities that you serve as appropriate. You know, the survey findings we present today will highlight barriers uh, selected communities indicated as preventing them from accessing mental health services. It also highlights the types of care survey respondents feel are best to address their needs um, and the specific, the specific types of care respondents have or have not utilized in the past. And it also addressed some of the perceived stigmas uh, survey respondents think their potential support works networks uh, may have about them uh, seeking uh, help for mental health needs. Next slide, please. So at the outset, we wanted to really gain a baseline understanding as to actually what percentage of the population surveyed were being screened for any type of mental health condition. So on the left side of the slide, you'll see that 40% of the general population adult survey reported that they have been screened for a mental health condition in the past. Now of that 40% of the general population adults who have been screened for mental health condition, on the right side of the slide, you'll see that 36% of them say that they have been screened and they were actually diagnosed with the mental health condition. So if I were to say that in another way, in a population of 100 general population adults reflecting the U.S. population, 40% of them or 40 of the 100 people who were screened for a mental health condition and 36% of the 40 who were actually screened and, and, and diagnosed uh, with a medical um, health condition, about 15 people, um, you know, there were 15 people out of that 40 that actually were diagnosed. So I just want to make that clear again. I kind of uh, uh, went over it kind of fast. In a population of 100 general population adults, 40% or 40 were screened for a mental health condition. And 36% of that 40, um, which is about 15, were actually diagnosed with a mental health condition. And when we take at the, a look at the, the screening numbers for the Black adults and the LGBTQ plus adults surveyed, you'll see on the left side that only 33% of the Black adult surveyed reported ever being screened for a mental health condition, while 59% of the LGBTQ plus adults surveyed reported being screened. Now, we mentioned earlier that our panelists are going to dive a bit deeper into some of the potential explanations for this data, along with other issues and barriers faced by these populations when seeking mental health care. But we first want to get your thoughts. Um, uh, next slide, please. So we have an audience question. Uh, we wanna engage you. So would you be so kind as to tell us, in your opinion, what do you think our survey respondents highlighted as the biggest barrier to seeking healthcare? So you'll see a poll um, that I think should have just perhaps uh, popped up on your screen. If you could just respond to that. And I'll give people a few moments uh, to respond. So we can move to the next slide, please. If you selected uh, item number one, um, cost of ongoing therapy, congratulations, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and you know what we found is that you know we looked at three types of costs: uh, the cost of ongoing therapy, the cost of prescription medications, and lastly, the cost of of seeing a healthcare provider. And the cost of ongoing therapy and the cost of prescription medications were perceived to be the greatest barriers to seeking mental health help or treatment across all of the populations surveyed. Next slide, please. The survey it also examined the preferences uh, for the types of, of mental uh, health care uh, received. 
Um, and the findings that you see here on this slide indicate that approximately half of the general population, white, black, Hispanic, and AAPI adults surveyed actually prefer in-person care um, to teletherapy or virtual therapy, which was, um, you know, um, actually uh, among LGBTQ identifying adults, 43% indicated that they prefer in-person care um, to teletherapy. And that was the lowest among all the population surveyed. And you know, there was another very interesting finding among all groups surveyed, Native American adults have the highest preference for in-person care at 59%, as you see on the slide. Yet this group reported that they are more likely than adults of all other groups surveyed to have to travel 25 miles or more to access their nearest in-person mental health provider. Um, and, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the reality that the mental health and healthcare delivery in general has changed quite a bit as a result of the pandemic. And also, there may be a generational shift in preferences as to how healthcare services are received. As just one data point in this regard, younger adults are more likely than older adults to say they would seek actual virtual uh, therapy services or even a hybrid a care model versus the traditional one on one in person mental care that most others um, prefer. Next slide, please. So we, we've talked uh, quite a bit about the percentages of individuals who have accessed mental health services and, and some of their greatest reported barriers to care. Let's pivot briefly and, and, and talk about those who report that they have not accessed any mental health resources to address their concerns. And we wanna dive deeper into some thoughts about why this may be the case. So here's another question in the, in the chat box. Let, it, let us know what you believe is the approximate percentage of, of general population adults with mental health concerns who report that they have not accessed any services to address their mental health concerns. And note, this is an approximation. We didn't want to you know, have you see the numbers and be able to guess them uh, right away. So um, I believe a poll should have popped up and please put in your answer. All right, we'll give you just a couple of more uh, seconds. So the number is, uh, next slide, please. So the number is actually 36%. Um, and, um, you know, you know, it's like 36% of the general population adults who report that they have not accessed any services for their mental health. Imagine that. Um, honestly, the percentage of individuals who haven't accessed uh, mental health services, it's, it's of great concern for all populations surveyed, but this percentage was the highest among the Black adults surveyed at 41%. Take a note also that the percentage of adults who have not accessed any resources for their mental health concerns was lowest for the LGBTQ plus population at 24%. Next slide, please. So, let, let's let's talk about one-on-one -on -one traditional um, in-person therapy in more detail. The survey looked at 11 different resources for addressing mental health concerns, which included one-on-one -on -one traditional in-person therapy, medication assistance, physical exercise, stress management tools, telehealth with the therapist, spiritual guidance, art therapy, social support networks, group therapy, referrals to other resources, and mental health hotlines. And the survey findings indicated that approximately 72% of the general population adults, remember that's a group that is reflective of the United States Senate census, but they uh, perceive one-on-one -on -one or in-person therapy to be the most effective resource to address their mental health concerns. Now, this does not, however, mean that this large majority of adults has actually accessed traditional one-on-one -on -one mental health services, as we know. And also remember that we shared earlier that younger individuals may prefer virtual or teletherapy or a hybrid model for their mental health care versus the one-on-one. -on -one. And when we look at the demographic breakdown on the right side of this slide, we see that only approximately 25% or a quarter of the Black, Hispanic, and AAP, AAPI populations reported having access to traditional in-person one-on-one therapy for their mental health concerns. Now, this is quite concerning. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. One potential rationale for the Black population not accessing one-on-one -on -one mental health therapy could actually lie in the stigma that is associated with treating mental health concerns within this community in particular. 
when compared to other populations surveyed across the board, the Black population um, attached the largest amount of perceived stigma to others. And this definitely has the potential to impact their feelings about and, and willingness to seek mental health treatment. Uh, as you see here, 51% of Black adults surveyed perceived stigma from their family members. That's a green bar. 43% uh, perceived stigma from their faith-based counselor. That's a pink bar. And 46% perceived stigma uh, to their primary doctors. Um, that's a purple bar. And now, while all of the population survey call out stigma as an independent and impediment to seeking care, for decades, a Black population in particular has called out stigma, real or perceived, as a major concern and barrier to accessing mental health services. Our panelist, Mr. Vic Armstrong, will definitely talk more about this during his presentation. And while LGBTQ plus uh, adult survey attached somewhat lower levels of stigma to family members, faith-based counselors, and primary care doctors than some of the other groups, I'm certain that Dr. Dustin will agree that, that stigma and perceptions of stigma create many barriers to seeking mental health care and all health care services for the LGBTQ plus community. Indeed, there's so much more to unpack about the many barriers that negatively impact this group's ability to access mental health care services. Next slide, please. So to discuss these barriers in more detail, I'm delighted to transition to the next part of our webinar and introduce you to Dustin, Dr. Dustin Nowoski. Dr. Nowoski is a queer non-binary psychiatrist and also the founder and president of the international nonprofit LGBTQ plus health equity organization, OutCare Health. OutCare Health is doing amazing work to address barriers to care among the LGBTQ plus community, not just on a national, but on an international scale. And their ultimate goal is to transform their might into a powerful unicorn of social and public health change for LGBTQ plus people. Dr. Nowoski's clinical and philanthropic work has led to several national accolades, presentations, publications, and awards. Let's hear from Dr. Dustin as they introduce us to OutCare. Dr. Dustin? Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you all for your time today and giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Dr. Dustin Nowoski. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I am a practicing psychiatrist in Los Angeles, California, and also founder and president of OutCare Health. I started OutCare back in May of 2015, so we just had our eighth birthday, which was very exciting for us. Um, I was a medical student at the time. Um, starting medical education, I was very struck by um, the lack of LGBTQ plus awareness in medical education and across actually the country um, and healthcare professional schools as well. Um, I, I started out care both personally and also professionally. I wanted to find a provider that met my needs and understood me and my identities. And that was very challenging for me at the time. Um, but I also wanted to make sure that education was affirming as much as possible at the institution that I was at at the time, but also across the country. Um, doing my own research, I, I realized very quickly that there is a lot of stigma and discrimination that leads to physical and mental health disparities for LGBTQ plus communities. And that was back in 2015. And unfortunately, that stigma and discrimination is very pervasive and it is not going down. And in many regards, it's actually going up. Um, recently, um, OutCare um, partnered with HealthGrades and we launched this national study. And what we showed was actually there is a lot of distrust among LGBTQ plus communities. We saw that only half of LGBTQ plus people trust their providers, both their primary care doctors and medical specialists. But we also saw that there is a pervasive distrust with healthcare systems. Only 17% of LGBTQ plus people trust healthcare systems in general. And we know that only 15% of LGBTQ plus people trust insurance companies, which is a significantly less amount compared to cisgender heterosexual people. And so all of this pervasive stigma was very meaningful for me on a personal level and an academic and a professional level, which really led to the formation of OutCare back in 2015. We grew, we grew pretty quickly after that. Uh, we gained our nonprofit status um, in 2017. And as we stand today, we are a very large national and international organization composed of many, many diverse identities and people across the world um, with the ultimate goal to facilitate a shift in LGBTQ plus care and LGBTQ plus health equity. We do that in a variety of ways, and we have a lot of services and initiatives, including information, education, training, 
um, consultation. We have a lot of resource and provider directories. We have a mentorship program, support groups, webinar series, research, you name it. The list goes on and on and on. Um, and all of these services and initiatives are very, very important and impactful for millions of people across the country and the world. Uh, next slide, please. And as I mentioned, we have a lot of services and initiatives. And so here um, are a couple of our offerings that we provide through OutCare Health across the world. Uh, we have a, a community resource database where we've identified resources in all states in the U.S. Um, we also have a directory of LGBTQ plus affirming providers, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. We have a mentorship program where we connect mentees to mentors across the country. Uh, we do our own research. We have a lot of education training that we deliver to healthcare and non-healthcare organizations. Uh, we have an OutTalk webinar series. We actually have one today on um, the anti-LGBTQ plus legislation that is occurring across the country. Um, if you're interested, you can um, go to our website and sign up today. It will be from 6 to 7 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We also have support groups. We have blogs. Um, and as I said, we also work with a lot of institutions uh, to change their education and their curriculums. Next slide, please. Um, and so um, I was tasked with coming up with a case study, and um, actually it was it was quite difficult for me to pick one case study because uh, we receive requests uh, for people across the country pretty much every single day at this point um, from many, many different communities coming from many identities, experiences, and backgrounds. Um, and uh, I provide this as a case example because I do think it highlights a lot of the concerns that we we hear from people in the communities. Um, and this is this is a very long quote, so I'm going to give a, a couple of minutes for everyone to read and digest it, um, and we'll talk about it in a moment. But keep in mind, uh, this is a quote that we actually receive a, a lot uh, on a weekly basis. I actually received a very similar request. Um, actually, I received three requests this morning alone um, that were very similar to this essence. So I'll give everyone a moment to read this. And just to point out a couple of things within this quote, um, th these are things that we hear often from a lot of LGBTQ plus people across the country. Um, we have many, many people coming to us looking um, for affirming providers. It is very common um, for, for many LGBTQ plus people not to have affirming providers. Um, and what ends up happening is there is a lot of stigma and discrimination that is experienced by providers and healthcare environments, including uh, staff, physical location, safety concerns, um, that unfortunately leads to a delay in care and actually many people avoiding care altogether. As a provider myself, I have cared for many people where I'm the first provider they have seen in 10, 15, sometimes even 20 years because of something that happened 20 years ago from a provider. This is a huge cycle that we need to break. And so we often hear from LGBTQ plus people that they are terrified to go to providers and to find information. Um, we also know that actually um, lived experience is extremely powerful for many people, including LGBTQ plus people. And we often have people asking us for LGBTQ plus identifying providers. Um, it's very common actually for people to ask us for specific identities that match exactly the identity that they have at that point in time. Um, but also, as you can see here, um, we unfortunately hear a lot of um, experiences of, of past negativity and stigma. And so, for instance, this person was telling us, you know, please, um, I'm looking for more information. Um, I'm, I'm actually kind of scared because I've had a lot of experiences that have been very stigmatizing in the past. Um, next slide, please. And so the, the way um, that we can actually provide LGBTQ plus affirming providers and affirming information to people across the country can be very difficult. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of distrust. Um, and when people are coming to us, they're actually putting a lot of trust in our hands to provide them with the most affirming information and resources out there. And so we do that in a variety of different ways. We are considered an LGBTQ plus care navigation system and in many regard. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have an Alice directory um, of affirming providers. This is a public publicly accessible directory. Um, you know, these numbers change um, all the time, which is really great for us, but I, I provided this to Pan not too long ago and we had reached 3,500 and now we're almost at 3,700. So we have providers joining across the country every single day that spanned all states in the country, um, seven, actually eight countries in total and, and four continents um, and over 50 different specialties. 
As I mentioned earlier, we also uh, connect people with um, support groups, webinar series, databases, mentorship programs, you name it. Um, historically, all that information lived online, and so people had to access that um, in their own time and at their own leisure, um, but we wanted to make that process a little bit more formal and close gaps um, in, a, in a more meaningful way. And so we actually have formalized a specific care navigation program where we have care navigators that will interact with LGBTQ plus people one-on-one -on -one, um, and talk about all of these services and how they can tap into them. Um, we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. You know, trust is an extremely, extremely important topic for LGBTQ plus people because of the pervasive distrust that they've had with providers and health systems. Um, it's very common for people to come to us after we provide the resources, and you can still see that there's a lot of um, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, um, because they're not actually sure if we're going to provide affirming information based on past experiences of marginalization. Um, but also support is very, very critical for LGBTQ plus people in communities. I mean, what we have found actually is that there is much more meaningful engagement, dialogue, and interactions when LGBTQ plus people are communicating and networking with people of similar identities and lived experience. It is probably one of the most important things for LGBTQ plus people is to work with people that identify um, in a very similar way or an exact way. Next slide, please. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation, uh, Dr. Dustin. We really appreciate uh, the yeoman's work, actually, that you and your team are doing to actualize your organization's uh, vision to create a world where every LGBTQ plus person has access to quality health care and feels empowered to live their healthiest, most authentic life. We really appreciate all you do. So. Now it's a privilege to introduce you to our next speaker, Mr. Vic Armstrong. Um, Mr. Armstrong is a director of Soul Shop for Black Churches, a national initiative whose mission is to equip faith community leaders with the tools they need to save lives and, and actually bring hope to those affected by suicidal desperation. Uh, Mr. Armstrong previously served as a chief diversity officer for RI International and as chief health equity officer for the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. He has over 30 years of experience in human services, primarily dedicated to building and strengthening community resources to serve individuals who have been historically marginalized. And uh, Mr. Armstrong is a nationally recognized speaker on issues regarding health equity and access to health care particularly as it relates to individuals living with mental health challenges. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Vic, um, who will introduce us to the important mission and vision of Soul Shop for Black Churches. Vic? Thank you so much, Dr. Richardson, and, and uh, thank you to uh, Penn Foundation for having me as part of this discussion today. And I do like to, 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 uh, to frame the conversation by first stating that when we talk about Soul Shop for Black Churches, that it is not a religious program. It is, it, it is, in fact, a program that's designed to create access to mental health resources uh, in the Black community. The other thing that I will say, uh, just to kind of uh, frame this discussion, is that I do come to this, uh, to this work from a couple of different perspectives. One, I was born and raised in rural North Carolina as the son of a pastor. My father pastored uh, for 48 years and just recently retired from pastoring in the, in the past uh, five or six years. So I was really socialized in the Black church, and it was a part of my upbringing. And one of the things I often share with folks is that um, as much as I frequented the church growing up, and as much as the church was such an integral part of the Black community, I never heard my father um, as a pastor or any of his colleagues talk about mental health from the pulpit, uh, or suicide for that matter. And even outside the pulpit, when suicide was discussed, it was really discussed as something that was not a Black problem. Uh, we were told basically that suicide was a white problem and that um, it was not something that impacted uh, the Black community. Um, and so having grown up with that background and then um, also having a career in mental health, uh, this just seemed to be the, the convergence of two things that I have a lot of passion about and things that I see as being integral parts of at least my experience in the Black community. Next slide. So as we talk about, uh, again, the mission and vision of Soul Shop, uh, we talk about the mission being equipping faith communities to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide desperation. So it is about teaching faith leaders how to, to talk to and minister to those in their congregations and their communities who are impacted by suicide 
uh, either as uh, suicide attempt survivors themselves, as suicide loss survivors who have lost someone to suicide, as individuals who are worried about someone who may be uh, thinking about suicide, uh, or individuals who may be experiencing suicide ideation on their own, and recognizing that at any given time we have these people in our congregations. And then the vision being the national leader uh, in developing faith communities that companion those impacted by suicide into hope and connection. We do recognize that for individuals who experience suicidal desperation, generally speaking, they have, they have either lost hope or lost connection. And Soul Shop is an, um, is an attempt uh, to give them that hope and to give that, them that connection to uh, the faith-based community. But again, there's a much uh, less ex existential um, reality here. And that is that it is about creating access for people to access mental health resources uh, where they live, work, play, and pray. Next slide. So when we think about the role of the Black church, uh, we think that the church is, is uniquely positioned as a change agent, as a change agent in really helping to shape and shift the perception of the impact of mental health and the impact of um, suicide on, on in the Black community. The church has always been the gateway to the Black community. It's been a gateway to be able to reach and mobilize people in the Black community. It's been a way of both communicating to folks within our community what's important to us, but also uh, communicating to people outside the Black community what's important to the Black community. The church has always been on the front lines in terms of political action, in terms of civil rights action. So we see the church as being uh, that gateway to being able to, to really get a broad message across to uh, the Black community. The church also shapes religious um, and, and cultural norms. And so much of, again, as for, for my own personal upbringing, much of the way that I was socialized and taught what was important to me and to my community were things that I learned um, at growing up in the Black church. It's been a place of refuge, of healing, and strong kinship. It's been a place of social services. It's the first place that many of us learned to go uh, to, to get our social services needs met. When people were in need of resources, if they were struggling to pay a light bill, or if there were uh, individuals in the family who were sick and there was no insurance, the church was often a place that people in the Black community turned. It was also a place of political activity um, and of social activism. And again, it's been a source of hope and healing uh, for those impacted by suicide. But for many, um, their experience in dealing with the church has been that the church was not equipped was not ready, was not prepared, and was not willing to talk about suicide or to create a space where it was comfortable for other um, people in the congregation to talk about suicide. Uh, and then again, we see the church as always having been a, a community partner uh, for community health interventions. So when we've had other health interventions, even when we think back to our work in uh, dealing with the COVID pandemic, oftentimes we went to the faith-based community to help us um, uh, really think about um, how to navigate the Black community in terms of giving people access to vaccines and, uh, and testing sites. Next slide. When we think about the, the, the way that the Black community thinks about mental health, there's a great deal of stigma, stigma in the community, but there's also been a great deal of stigma uh, that has been perpetrated by uh, the Black church. Uh, mental health challenges, including depression and anxiety or suicidal ideation have been viewed as moral uh, or spiritual failures. It's been seen as a lack of faith. And so one of the things that we have to do is help the church to be able to navigate not only how to talk about uh, um, those things today, but also to navigate the fact that uh, in, in large part in the past, uh, the church has, has had a negative impact on people being willing to seek out help for mental health services because of characterizing it as a uh, moral failure or a lack of faith. Uh, and then also uh, there's been a tendency in the black church to, to uh, pit one against the other. So you would have to choose whether you were going to be a person of faith or whether you were going to uh, be a person that was gonna seek out mental health services. And so we thought very differently in the past about people being willing to seek out services for physical health as opposed to mental health. For mental health, uh, it's often been portrayed as you would not have anxiety, you would not have depression if you were a stronger Christian, if you prayed more. Uh, there's also been a perception in the Black community that because uh, we are Black, we are a resilient people, and that as a resilient people, 
uh, we should not be experiencing depression or anxiety. And we have passed that on to our young people, which in the, in the sense says to our young people, you don't have the right to be uh, experiencing depression. You don't have the right to experience anxiety. You don't have the right to experience suicide ideation uh, because you come from a resilient people. And that has really um, been transformed to misinformation uh, in our community that, that again tells us that mental health challenges are not things that impact the black community. And that if and when they do, we should deal with it within our community and we should not seek um, help outside the community. But the impact of that is that our silence has been harmful to our community and particularly our, uh, particularly our young people as we look at the escalating rates of suicide. Next slide. So as we look at um, the problem that has, has, has been uh, developed both in part because of misinformation about how we have talked about suicide and, and mental health challenges, but also because of the fact that we have oftentimes even been silent on the fact, um, we recognize that, um, our, our, that suicides are increasing. 2019, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services found that suicide was a leading cause of death among Black men and women between the ages of 15 and 24. We also found that just in the recent data released by the CDC, that even during the time of 2018, 2019, and going into 2020, when we saw suicide rates decreasing for the overall population, and we touted those, uh, those changes, that what we did not highlight was the fact that suicide rates were, in fact, increasing in Black and Hispanic and, and um, Indigenous communities, even while suicide rates were decreasing for other communities. So what that tells us is that we have to be more intentional about drilling down into communities and looking at how we disaggregate that data so that even when we see suicide rates for uh, the overall numbers going down, that they, we still may be missing uh, specific segments of the population. And then we often find that faith leaders and faith communities are first responders because statistically, uh, black people are more likely to go to a faith leader than they are to go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist when they're experiencing mental health challenges. The difference is when they go to a faith leader, that faith leader may not always recognize those issues as mental health challenges or issues that need to be addressed by a mental health professional. Next slide. And so as we think about the challenges of the Black community in dealing with mental health challenges and suicide, we recognize that Black Americans are far less likely to initiate treatment and more likely to terminate treatment prematurely. In fact, um, Black Americans are about 20% more, more likely to identify social or, or psychological stressors, but then less likely to initiate treatment, more likely to terminate treatment prematurely. And so uh, we utilize Soul Shop as an intervention, which is a one-day workshop that's designed to teach faith leaders, including clergy, um, including any leaders in the church. We often have mental health professionals who will also uh, attend, especially faith-based clinicians. And we spend a day uh, working with them to teach them uh, the, st the statistics on uh, the impact of suicide in the Black community, making them aware that suicide is an issue for the Black community. Uh, we also teach them really how to incorporate teaching about suicide and mental health into their doctrine. <coughs> many the, the challenge that they've had is that they see um, uh, talking about suicide and mental health as something that's contrary to their doctrine. So we talk about the fact that you can do both. We try to give them resources. Uh, we will create, um, whenever we go into a community, we will create um, handouts for folks in that community of how to access resources within their community. We teach them how to talk about suicide, how to recognize the signs of suicide. And then we give them practical um, tools to be able to, um, to deal with that. And so the end result is that we want to uh, reframe how those church leaders view and address mental health. And then we try to give them the resources to make it as simple for them as possible to be able to put things in place to help individuals address uh, those challenges. Next slide. And so again, at a social workshop, we'll talk about suicide awareness. We'll give them the basic skills to talk about it. Uh, we'll share with them how to skills or, or a resource on how, on how to prevent suicide in their community. Um, we will uh, help them um, to, to really build a platform so that individuals who have experienced suicide desperation in their congregations are able to really talk about and share that with other people who may benefit from that lived experience, um, how to work, how to work with those families and be a partner in, in, in that. And then also how to 
build it and incorporate it into the ministry of the church and how to connect with outside resources. Next slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vic. We really, really appreciate all the great work that you and Soul Shopper are, are doing. Uh, without question, um, you are naming and decreasing some of the stigma surrounding um, mental health care and treatment within the Black community. And in so doing, your organization is undoubtedly saving lives. Um, so now that we've heard from both of our wonderful panelists, we're going to now move into our panel discussion. And uh, we have a few minutes. Um, and I just uh, want to start out by asking you, Vic, you know, you talked about some of the reasons that suicide and mental health have been difficult subjects to talk about in the Black community. You talked about, you know, your organization, but, you know, there are quite a few um, uh, traditional and or secular sources and resources out there that already address suicide prevention. You know, what makes uh, the Soul Shop approach different? You talked about, you know, kind of, you know, your dad didn't talk about it from the pulpit. Uh, how do you really uh, differentiate yourself and really get to the heart of the issue? And most importantly, how do you make a difference in people who have been, you know, taught all of their lives that this is not a, a issue for the Black community? What's your secret sauce? Yeah, so a couple of things, uh, and and it really isn't rocket science, but one of the things that um, that we, we try to do is make it relevant. So we'll share data that lets them know that this is something that's happening in your community, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. It is something that's happening. We also talk a lot in, in our uh, presentation about the what is unique about the Black experience. So we're talking not just about suicide prevention, but really talking about it in the framework of these are challenges that are unique to being Black in America. And so while there are a lot of secular resources that talk about suicide and suicide prevention, there are not secular resources that both tie it to the unique Black experience, but also can talk about it in a way that um, that utilizes church lingo, that utilizes the church structure, that talks about the church as a community and as a source of hope and healing. Okay, I, I, I get that. That that's wonderful. You know that that unique experience. Um, let me move to Dr. Dustin. Dr. Dustin, um, you know, you mentioned in your presentation you you, you referenced LGBTQ plus affirming care. Um, can you talk just a little bit more about that? I know certainly that I, as a physician, you know, didn't receive any specialized training or care, uh, you know, about how to care for the LGBTQ plus population. Can you can you just talk a little bit of, about what you mean when you say um, LGBTQ plus affirming? Uh, talk a yeah, bit. yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. We get the question a lot, actually. Um, I will say affirming is... Um, Kind of a newer word in healthcare and medicine. I think historically we used, you know, terminology like patient-centered, right, or holistic care, or um, patient-forward care. You know, I've heard it all on variations. I um, mean, you know, I don't even remember actually um, hearing the word affirmation or affirming in my medical education, which wasn't too long ago. And so, you know, throughout your health, we we want to get at this idea of this dynamic process that's very complex, and you can't simplify it with just one word, right? Um, historically, when we talked about care for LGBTQ plus people, there were a lot of words and phrases like LGBTQ plus friendly, LGBTQ plus sensitive. But, you know, it was getting at this idea that we think most providers should have, right? It wasn't really that descriptive. And so when we talk about LGBTQ plus affirmation and LGBTQ plus affirming providers, we're really trying to get that idea that it's much more complicated and complex than that. It's really this longitudinal journey of learning with the community and not in silo. So whenever we say affirming, we're really trying to get at that idea of providing the provision of care, of treatment, of services. And you can get at that idea in a variety of ways. It can be either lived experience and identities. It can be education and experience. It can also be values and goals. And so it's all of these pieces together that really create a provider who could be affirming for LGBTQ plus people. Great. Thank you for uh, making that clear. You know, it, it, you know it, it's so important to kind of understand the vernacular and, uh, you know, the language, as you said, changes so often. We want to make sure that we are understanding and, and, and basically starting from the same um, place. Here's a question I want to ask. Actually, I'm going to put out there for, for both of you. We, we spent quite a, a bit of time talking about what we should do. Let's talk about what we really should not do. So I'd like for each of you just to briefly um, uh, talk about 
what are some of the things that we must avoid? What are some of the missteps? And, and maybe give me one or two um, missteps that, that, that have happened and, and how we can avoid um, you know, having a negative um, impact when engaging with communities that you, you serve. And in essence, what, what one or two things could derail us? And let's start with um, you, Vic. So one of the things I think is um, anytime we think that one size fits all, we, we are already um, setting ourselves up for failure. The other thing I think, is particularly in going into a community that is that is not your natural community, um, is to assume that you know that community, to take for granted that you know that community, um, and not to acclimate yourself to that community in terms of, you know, what does it mean um, uh, when you look at who hold, who wields power in that community, who are the trusted voices? What's a, what does a trusted message look like in that community? And what is it that that community wants to tell us versus what it is that we're trying to tell them? Yeah, I, I think that that all makes sense. Um, Dr. Dustin? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you, Vic. This is a huge problem for LGBTQ plus people. We you know, sometimes I, I see a lot of industries, especially, you know, it's Pride Month, right? And so we see all these industries that are um, putting their logos in rainbow, or they're doing these one and done type of seminars or webinars. And, you know, that I think it has its time and place, and it's very valuable. It's it's better than nothing. But I find that sometimes organizations then think that it's enough, right, to do kind of these one and done or specialized endeavors. And there is a lot of pushback from marginalized communities to say, well, what about the rest of the year? You know, we, we have these disparities, not not just during Pride Month, it's throughout the entire year. And so one of the biggest missteps that I see is all of this effort gets put in and resource gets put into delivering a, a one and done type of scenario when really it should be this longitudinal journey of support. But I completely agree with you, Vic, encroaching in on communities without people that have those identities and lived experience is honestly probably more damaging than, than doing something at all. So it is, you know, it's um, again, there's a lot of a lot of distrust um, with LGBTQ plus people and marginalized communities, and you really have to not only provide the service but provide it in an affirming way as well. Yeah, and I love that idea of you know longitudinal efforts. Uh, you know, throughout the year. I mean, you think about Black History Month, right? You know, all you know these thirty days you're supposed to focus on Black History Month or Pride Month. I mean, you're supposed to focus, but uh, in fact, in Black History is not even thirty days. You know, it's the shortest <laughs> month of the year, as we all know. Um, you know, I wanted to to ask you a question, uh, Dr. Dustin. Um, we heard from the survey that cost is a barrier for all adults in accessing mental health services. Are there any factors that are, you know, specific or unique to the LGBTQ plus community? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, cost, um, as a psychiatrist, I know this, I work in system. Cost is typically, you know, the, the most important topic and the, the highest rated topic whenever we're talking about burdens of care. I um, mean, it's extremely and especially relevant for LGBTQ plus people. You know, I saw the data on the slide and I actually, um, it was fascinating because we've collected our own data about burdens of care. And what we found too was the exact same numbers. About 50% of LGBTQ plus people uh, recognize that uh, cost is a barrier to care compared to to about 40% of cisgender heterosexual people. So it's much higher. Um, and I think the numbers were almost exact, which is pretty fascinating. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, many LGBTQ plus people do live below the poverty line. Many more LGBTQ plus people have um, and are experiencing being unhoused. Uh, a lot of past data has shown that LGBTQ plus people earn 90 cents to every dollar um, that's earned by cisgender heterosexual people. But also we know a lot of LGBTQ plus people do not have insurance. They have difficulty keeping their health insurance. Uh, many more are paying out of pocket cost. And then we also know though, that there are many other burdens of care that are absolutely related to costs like transportation, child and el elderly support, that is a much, much higher rate of disparity compared to cisgender heterosexual people. So, you know, this isn't, um, a, you know, an, a simple solution, right? Of just saying, well, maybe we'll we'll close the gap and pay. Um, I think that's a part of it, but there's also all of these other layerings of complexity with stigma, discrimination, and then other other dimensions of care that absolutely impact cost. Right. Yeah, it's it's so vitally important. All of those factors impact your ability to access care. Um, Vic, I just wanted to ask you. You know, you know, you talked about Soul Shop and the great work that that you're doing. Um, around suicide prevention. If if some of our audience members wanted to get started with this work and they were interested in partnering with the faith-based community on suicide prevention efforts, where, where would you recommend that they start? 
So, of course, you can go to our website. You can go to soulshopmovement.org or you can email me at, at vic at soulshopmovement.org uh, and I'd be glad to work with you. But uh, but I think also um, I always advise people to, to look at what's available in your community. Um, if there are ministerial alliances in your community, if there are faith-based organizations that really have been uh, working in this space of mental health and, and mental health awareness, they may be your go-to to go to first to say, hey, you know, we we would love to partner with you on how we create and sustain uh, something that um, speaks to mental health challenges in your community. The other thing I tell people too, when you think about the faith-based community, especially the black community, you may have to think differently about um, who holds power. There may be an individual who may be the lowest person, person on the totem pole at your job. They may be the pastor or, you know, the uh, board president at the local church. And so that may be a person who's a power broker for you. So think about who has access to the community and how you utilize them. If you can, if you can get to a, you know, a state level convention or a ministerial alliance, you can often you know, uh, get access to an even greater audience of faith leaders. That sounds wonderful. We are getting close to time. Uh, audience, I've been waiting for a question and we got one from Roxanne Lewis. And I'm going to post this question to both of you. I'll ask you to answer it very quickly because we have like exactly like a minute. Uh, so uh, Roxanne says, what is the single most important factor for each panelist in educating the public about mental health? I think that's a great one to end on. So let's start with you, um, Dr. Dustin, and then we'll end with, with Vic. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the most important things for me in mental health um, is absolutely validating communities and their identities and their cultures, but also making sure that we are uh, enabling trust and, and creating a culture of trust and providing that support. As I mentioned a couple of times, you know, there is a lot of distrust um, in mental health. There's a lot of distrust in mental health providers um, in mental health services, and especially in marginalized communities. So one of the most important points that I can leave when we're talking um, is, is community the engagement cannot be stressed enough, but also enabling and creating a culture of trust for those communities. Yeah, and I would say I would agree with everything Dustin said. I think the other thing is just realizing that access is not just about physical proximity to traditional resources. Access is about creating resources that are relatable to my life experience that I'm willing to utilize. Uh, and so as we're creating the access, think about what are people willing to utilize, not just what we're willing to give them. Thank you both so much. We have um, key tips and takeaways that you'll get in the slides that each of you are going to get a copy of. And I want to apologize for my mix up in the beginning. Um, and then I want to turn it over to, to Kim to close us out. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Dara, and to our uh, esteemed panelists for your uh, for the discussion today. I uh, want to let you know that um, we've got uh, the key tips and takeaways on the screen, but want to share what's next. Our national poll findings are going to be published in July and hoping, hoping that you're going to look forward to our next webinar that will occur in September. And um, we will be talking about diversity in clinical trials at that time. So we hope to see you again. Thanks for joining. Thank you, everyone.